Good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome all of you to the College of Complexes. Uh, the college has basically two rules. One is no personal attacks, and the second is one rule at a time, and that's usually the microphone. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we have a brief announcements period. Then our speaker will speak. Then we have our question and answer period. We ask that you have questions at the questions period and not a rebuttal because you may be able to rebut after the question and answer period. So, without further ado, I'd like to Order! Order! Is there All right. We're going to be talking tonight about gold standard pieces fiat money. Germinal G. Van, author and political essayist, SPS from the Libertarian Party of Chicago, states that the purpose of this speech is to draw a comparison between the gold standard and fiat money and see which one of the two is the best suited to continuing inflation. Both monetary systems are still relevant up to today, and although the gold standard the monetary system has been dissolved since 1971, in this speech, Germinal will attempt to demonstrate that the gold standard is a better system than fiat money because it concerns the power of the federal government. The gold standard precludes the government to go over its budget. Let's welcome Germinal G. Van. Well, um, good evening, everyone. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be back here. I remember the first, the first speech was more intense. I hope this one will be less. But let's see if my assessment is right once, once we move to the Q&A. So gold standard versus fiat money. As, um, as he was explaining, the goal is to explain, so basically to make a distinction between the two and see which one uh, is a better system to attenuate inflation. Because inflation is the central element of any economy. Whenever we have expansion or whenever we have um, a recession, because of the level or the rate of inflation. So I'm going to start with fiat money because this is the system that we currently use, not just in the United States, but all around the world. So fiat money is a monetary system in which paper money has no intrinsic value. So money is not backed by any physical commodity. Its value is determined by government decree. So that is the government decide that uh, whatever piece of paper has legal tender, so that piece of paper actually becomes money and we can use it to make any purchase. In, fiat, in the fiat uh, money system, any money declared by the government is legal tender. So the value of fiat money is derived from relationship between supply and demand and the stability of issuing government rather than worth of a commodity backing it. So fiat money is, is inconvertible and cannot be redeemed. And the thing with fiat money is that the risk of losing, so fiat money can lose value quicker than the gold standard because of inflation or hyperinflation. And fiat money inclines government to print more money than it should when there are times of recession, so to put more money in the economy to stimulate demand. With fiat money, central banks have control over the economy, over the supply, and they manage economic variables such as credit supply, liquidity, interest rates, and money velocity. A currency tied to gold is generally more stable than fiat money because of the limited supply of gold. So now I'm going to talk about the advantage of fiat money. So the main advantage is that there is no, there's no need for a currency to be backed by any commodity. So banks, uh, so the government and banks can print as much as they want, which give them control over money supply, uh, interest rate, and, li and liquidity. So basically, fiat money works best during times of recession. And the main disadvantage of that is that unlimited ability for, of the government to print more money whenever they want can also create hyperinflation. Now I'm going to move to the gold standard. So the gold standard is a monetary system in which the value of currency is determined by a set amount of gold. 
uh, the United States left the gold standard because the gold standard constrained the, the power of the federal government in money supply. It, the gold standard can operate with, with or without government involvement in the minting of gold coins, gold back paper currency, and, provision of, and provisions of checking accounts. The purchasing power of the gold standard is pretty much, is pretty much stable. The importance of the gold standard is that it arrests control of the issuance of money out of the hands of imperfect human beings. So basically, the gold standard forces us to be more responsible with the way we decide to spend our money. A physical quantity of gold enables the limitation of that issuance and also reduce potential risk of inflation. Every society needs inflation once in a while to sustain economic growth. That being said, unhealthy inflation is generally at two or three percent. Under a free market system, the gold, um, the gold standard should be viewed as the currency because it constrains any risk of inflation or deflation. It prevents government to overprint or to overborrow money. So the main advantages of the gold standard is that it limits the power of the federal government uh, and banks to cause inflation by excessive issue of paper currency. Secondly, it creates, uh, it creates certainty in international trades by providing fixed pattern of exchange rates. And the main disadvantage about the gold standard is that the lack of flexibility in the money supply and, the, and that countries may not be able to isolate their economy from the depression or inflation. And thirdly, the process of adjustment for countries with payment deficit can increase unemployment. So now I'm going to give you guys a brief history of the gold standard on my computer here, so give me some time to open it up. <coughs> so now I'm going to give you guys a brief history of the gold standard and to fully understand uh, how the gold standard works, uh, it's important to know how it was generated in the first place. So for the first 40 years of its existence in the United, uh, in the United States, the gold standard uh, it operated on a bimetallic bi system of gold and silver. In 1834, Congress adjusted the silver to gold ratio from 15 to 1 to 16 to 1. Silver begins to be exported, and by 1850, silver coins all but disappeared in the United States, and the yellow metal became the principal form of currency. In 1861, Simon Chase, the Treasury Secretary, printed the first U.S. paper currency. In 1900, the Gold Standard Act established gold as the only metal for redeeming paper currency. It set the value of gold at $20.67 an ounce, which means that one dollar worth one twentieth ounce of gold. Thus, the gold standard has become the legal tender which officiates the utilization of gold as the principal commodity and unit of measure to determine the value of the dollar. The gold standard guaranteed that the government would redeem any amount of paper money for its value in gold. And by the end of the, of the 19th century, another form of money had become increasingly common, checks. So checks functioned much the same as banks note had it. They permitted the public to conduct business with a smaller amount of coin and legal tender than they, than they would have done it otherwise. But checks suffered from the same defects as that the bank's notes had earlier in the century. Banks were prone to periodic runs by customers demanding cash from their checking, from the checking account. In 1913, the problems of check, checks created um, 
the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve was created specifically by Congress as a lender of last resort. In 1933, the Gold Standard Act was repealed by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in order to address the Great Depression. The Gold, the gold Reserve Act replaced the Gold Standard Act, which means that the retention of gold through private ownership was outlawed. In 1971, President uh, Richard Nixon definitively eliminated gold redeemability and passed the law which enacted paper money as the new legal tender, which enabled the government to, re to retain control over spending and borrowing money by decree. So, so fiduciary money was effectuated as fiat money. So government monopolized money, which is fiat money, only supplied by the government itself as no real value. So now I'm going to talk about the gold standard, the real bills doctrine, and the Great Depression. So the gold standard did not generate the crash of the stock market of 1929, but the Federal Reserve did. In 1917, the United States was engaged in World War I, and could not subsidize its military expenditure, expenditures by solely relying on the gold standard. So President Woodrow Wilson took the United States economy of the gold standard and used the Federal Reserve to print more money so that the United States government could supply money to its military arsenal during the war. The early 1920s saw the rise of the Federal Reserve as the central authority which has become the regulator of the value of gold. As they thought doing the right thing, the leaders of the, of the Federal Reserve committed the irreparable mistake which unfortunately led to the Great Depression. They passed a law that allowed the Federal Reserve to control the loans and credits that it would offer to commercial banks. This is how the real bills doctrine was implemented. According to a study conducted by Professor Richard H. Timberlake, who has extensively researched on the real base doctrine and monetary policy. The theory of the real base doctrine states that the unrestricted issuing of money in exchange for real bills will not cause excessive inflation from due increase in money supply and will not cause bank failure from illiquidity. So the Federal Reserve supplied an excess of money to commercial banks during the time of economic expansion, so from 1920 up to 1929. And based on another study, this time conducted by Professor Lawrence H. White, um, and that uh, study was published uh, by uh, Cato Institute, the real bills doctrine wrongly took the nominal quantity demanded of a particular type of credit yes, as a reliable guide to, the, a guide to the nominal quantity of money the public wants to hold. Moreover, Professor White argues that the, the real bills doctrine wrongly made the, re, the redeemability of bank liability an unimportant aspect of the process that determined the quantity of money. So the leaders of the Federal Reserve in effectuating the real base doctrine during the 1920s did not plan in their theory an alternative response to counter bank panics during times of economic recession. The accumulation of the excess of money supplied to commercial banks by the Federal Reserve has generated a substantial deflation. Prices of goods and services significantly shrunk below 0% of the inflation rate and this deflation subsequently created the crash of the stock market of 1929. So when FDR became president, one of his major acts as president was to increase the value of gold by enacting the Gold Reserve Act. The value of gold increased from $20.67 an ounce to $35 an ounce. In, uh, enacted in 1934, the Gold Reserve Act asserted that gold could no longer be retained by private ownership. 
the law required, required that gold certificate held by the Federal Reserve through private ownership be surrendered and invested in the Department of Treasury. Only licensed jurors were allowed to have gold for sales purposes. The Gold Reserve Act was the primary policy that in fact took the United States off the gold standard before Richard Nixon dissolved it in 1971. The Gold Reserve Act entrenched the, nationaliza the nationalization of money and of course it epitomized as well a clear and justified encroachment of the central government in the economy. The federal government did not need to take full control of the money supply to restore the economy. The Federal Reserve could have changed its monetary policy while leaving uh, commercial banks with the power to freely establish their own exchange rates without government interference. Subsequently to this lengthy analysis, I can confidently conjecture to all of you that the gold standard did not create the Great Depression, but the Federal Reserve was actually the one that generated that. This is, that was my presentation, and I'm now open to questions. tried to understand the difference and so your has anybody else making I mean I think in order to understand it you somebody's done something wrong right and I think it's the Federal Reserve you, you yeah, hear basically. a lot about that yeah. from that they are a private group right that they were put in kind of under the cover of Congress in 1913 it's why has it been, what can we do to challenge this? Is there any, like, could you make a case and prove it, the damage and reform it? Somehow? I mean, even if you made a case to prove it, who are you going to hold accountable for? Because it's a selected group of people who actually pass policies. I mean, their intention was not to necessarily create the Great Depression, but they were overconfident that the theory was right, and they didn't, and they did not, uh, think of whatever recession that would come up. He didn't think of a policy to counter the recession. But didn't like Rothschild and Morgan and all the creatures from Jekyll Island people, right? They, they're they profiting. They get like a percentage of all the debt and okay. are kind of pushing debt onto people unnecessarily through this fiat money system. And, and they seem like they, they cause inflation. And, kind of control everything. No, yeah, they do They do cause it's inflation because they have the power to print money whenever they want and whatever amount they want. And I was speaking with Brian earlier where we were saying that, and the reason why um, the United States does not want to leave fiat money is because there is a lot of countries that also depend on the dollar. So their debt, it's based on the dollar. So if they cannot pay their debt, the Federal Reserve is going to keep printing more money again. But when the Federal Reserve keeps printing more money and lend that money to those countries, inflation raised here in the United States. So it affects us and our taxes. So I assume that most of us here are middle class. We're the one who pays mostly for all the programs that the government created. And whenever in in inflation um, raised, our purchasing power decreases because prices are all up. Okay. Uh, just call on whoever you want. Yes, sir. Yeah, if, if we're not covered but backed up by gold, what, what's our dollar backed up by? Nothing. There's no, no, there's no, there's no commodity. That's not true. The, the money that you have in your wallet, is, it, it has value because the government says so. It was by decree. Full faith in credit. Exactly. Credit. Okay, how about? Yes, sir. Uh, doesn't the uh, supply of gold go up? I mean, uh, Spain, after uh, the discovery of the Americas, flooded Europe with gold, and we had a, a gold rush in California, and there was a gold rush in South Africa. Does that cause inflation, and how does that enter into your system? 
So the thing with the gold standard is that to have a high high inflation or hyper inflation, it, it will you will need to get to spend a lot of gold. But it's actually harder because based on the based on the amount of gold that you have, that's how you can spend the money available to you. So one of the reasons why Spain today is one of the poorest one of the poorest nations in Europe is that yes, in the 16th century they had a lot of gold. They proliferated that gold throughout Europe, but they did not develop the human capital. So because they didn't develop the human capital, they didn't teach the people how to actually um, use gold as a currency and then trans transfer that knowledge to the average. Yeah, you've heard that. Course. Yes, sir. Thank you. Which one of us? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't know. In the last 10 years, the Federal Reserve has been doing exactly what they, you said they did in the 20s. In fact, the reserve banks all over the world have been doing that, printing an astonishing amount of credit. And inflation is zero. And what's wrong? Or what's hear. right? Is there a moderator? We can't hear. You say uh, for the past 10 years, the Federal Reserve has been printing a lot of money, but inflation did not go up, right? Yes, that's exactly what he said. Okay. okay. Um, what I can say is that for, infl for inflation to go up, uh, all the countries that use the same currency should not be on, on the same page, first of all. For the past 10 years, if we say so, the past 10 years, so it's basically 2009, the United States was, was recovering from a recession. So, the, so the, um, the economic stimulus that President Obama injected in the economy was actually working. And that same economic stimulus was also passed by many European countries and other countries that actually collaborate with the United States. So inflation did not increase that quick because the economic stimulus package was into effect. But, however, he, it actually affected unemployment. Although people were, uh, were getting jobs, there was money in the economy to stimulate demand. On the other hand, unemployment was affected by the economic stimulus that President Obama injected in 2008-2009. Okay. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I heard someone say that in the last 10 years or something that inflation didn't go up. All I know is that when I was a 14-year-old boy, a hot dog with french fries cost a quarter. A gallon of gas cost a quarter. A cup of coffee cost a dime. And look where it's at today. If that isn't inflation, I'll kiss your ass in Marshall Field's window on the first day of the Christmas rush on the State Street side. It's been about consistent though, 350 for a hot dog at Gene and Jude's, 350 for a gallon of gas, and a cup of coffee yes, at sir. some of these places cost you 350. What uh, uh, what percentage of the major countries of the world uh, use fiat-based uh, uh, currency, and what percentage use gold or silver-backed uh, currency? Uh, all, so we have 195 countries on Earth, and all of them use fiat money. Oh, really? Yeah. To the dollar, right? Are they all the dollar? Yeah, the dollar. So, I mean, the, the UN uh, is trying to... What do you mean by fiat money? Fiat money is... Uh, the, money, fiat money is the money you use to buy whatever you're about to eat or whatever you eat. That's so fiat money. How many countries you say are in the No, no country. 195. No, there's 195 countries on Earth, and all of them are using fiat money. Not gold. Not gold. So all of this no, is no based countries, on, no countries on faith? Yes. Yes. yes, based on faith, yes. So we, we could have 
we could have like what happened in Germany in the 1920s. Exactly. We could have bales of money that yep. would be absolutely worthless except for extra yeah, credit. And, and, and that's the problem with fiat money, is that at any time the money could, get, could lose its value. With regard to why the inflation rate is so low when considering the amount of money that's, that's been produced, it seems to me there's two causes. The first was there was increasing competition from overseas, which, which, which kept prices from rising somewhat. Okay. The bigger cause was the collapse of the uh, velocity of money. Okay, it just the of what? This is the velocity of money. The money, the money was Where's basically. Where's the question? Yeah, it, it, it's a question. Who's answering okay, well, that question? Yes, yeah. Um, don't you think um, that uh, it's important the, the crypto, uh, a cryptocurrency system would be uh, superior to a gold standard and, and to the fiat system? So actually, yeah, the cryptocurrency is the one rising up. And philosophically, I agree with it because of the decentralization of its value. So you and I can you know, establish our own exchange rate, interest rate, or whatever, and the government doesn't need to interfere in it. But I'm still a little skeptical first. I mean, because um, I don't know where it will take me. I don't know if it will worth investing my money in it. But I know that cryptocurrency, it's on the rise for people to start using it. Well, if people transfer their full faith in the United States government, mm -hmm. the Treasury, mm -hmm. to another system, uh, then it's, it's complete. Okay. Yeah, but the U.S. will not let that happen. Right. No, no. <laughs> they won't let it happen. Economic forces can make it happen. Yeah. Hey, don't forget these guys in the back here. Yes, sir. What about me? Yeah, and what I meant. I'll, I'll come back. Can you please speak to the accusations against J.P. Morgan and others of manipulating the precious metals markets and depressing the price of precious metals in U.S. dollars? Say. I mean, to be honest, I I don't really have the knowledge about that part, so I can't really speak on it. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. There, there was a program on cable talking about Fort Knox, and they said Fort Knox is supposed to have all this gold, but they're spending this gold to pay bills. And they won't tell how much they got in there. And even foreign countries want to know, because we owe them money. Now, how does that affect the gold standard when all this money that they're supposed to have, they don't have in Fort Knox? Yeah. So, uh, so for that question is that I was researching on how the gold standard could be reinstate as, as an economic system and I know I don't know the exact amount that we need but it's worth way I mean three times or four times more than the debts that we currently have if we want to reinstate the gold standard as a um, as an economic system and live off it. So I don't know if we can actually uh, rehabilitate the gold standard as an economic system, but I will surely vouch for the cryptocurrency as a uh, as a substitute of the gold standard. Bitcoin, to, I thought that was yeah, it. Bitcoin, yeah, to, as a substitute over fiat money. Yeah. Okay, I think she. Do, yes. Do you think we're we're heading for a decline, a depression? In my life, we did never had a depression. Do you think that we will have a depression? In the uh, foreseeable future? Uh, depression is it's a little strong. I would say recession. So for us to have a depression, we need to be in an economic recession over two years. So I mean, studies have shown that there will be a forthcoming recession in 2020. We don't know how long it will last. Hopefully, it doesn't last the whole year. Hopefully, it doesn't last over two years. But you don't think we will ever be in depression anymore? I cannot, I cannot tell you if we necessarily have a depression. What, what is driving that prediction, a, a recession? And what, how do you forecast that? So I know that one of the, one of the elements that cause a, an economic recession usually is the economic stimulus package. So basically, economic stimulus package are meant for short-term gains. So that's when you use fiat money. So people are losing their mortgage, their houses, the economy is going bad. So you inject money in the economy 
so that people can work again. That's what President Obama did in 2009. But at the same time, if you go online and look at the, um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, it will show that unemployment actually took a long time to stabilize under the stimulus package. He was president in 2009, and unemployment was at 7.8%. In 2012, 2013, President Obama was like <coughs> four years in power, and, and, and unemployment was at 8%. So how do you explain that? How like, mm -hmm. unemployment still okay. going up, right. or do you inject a uh, stimulus package? So it was in 2016, so late 2016, that unemployment reached its level, its nominal level of 4.5 to 5 percent. So, uh, so basically, it means that when the government inject money into the economy, it also inject um, regulations for uh, for enterprises. So the great uh, benefactor in it is the government itself. So people get jobs, people get jobs and stuff, but in the long run, it's affecting the new, um, it's affecting the, the new system that is being established in the market. And that's how um, recessions are forecast. That's how they're coming. So the one that will be coming in 2020 will be a result of the 2008 recession. And the reason why the 2008 recession happened was because of the 2001 recession, when President Bush also inject money in the economy to stabilize jobs and employment and everything. Okay, you have it. All right. I wanted uh, to follow up with that question. I'm sorry, but um, yeah, like the question. job market is not really. I mean, does it really affect the job market? I mean, you think regulation, not yeah, the job does. market? Yeah, it does. I don't feel like there's a real job market. You got crappy jobs and no real okay. substantial. I mean, no, it, it does in a sense because who, who implements? Because, for instance, the, the, the minimum wage law is something that the government implements. It affects the job market because they implement a form of like wage that to, you know you need to qualify to get a job for it. They want to pass the $15 minimum wage. Actually, actually in DC, it is $14 an hour. There is no teenager that can be hired by Whole Food, you know, and work, you know, just to scan items and or mop the floor for $14 an hour. They will not pay for that. So yes, it affects the job market. Those, those okay. Those regulations. Yeah. But you All right. think the job All right. market. All right. You had you had a guy in the back, Charlie. You yes, had Charlie. a question. Yeah, terminal. When I came to my very first meeting at the College of Complexes, I heard about this gold standard and fiat money and learned of the disastrous things that were going to happen to our country. And none of them have come true. Why are we is still that a discussing question? this? Yes, it is. <coughs> What's your question? What's your question? He, he Why gave... are we still discussing this? Why are we still discussing this? Based, because it's nothing has happened, why are we it's still discussing this with Charlie Jensen? That it is harmful to the economy. 2008. We had a couple recessions before, and there is one coming again. So. That has nothing to do with this money stuff. I'm not because sure. of the trade. I'm and not the sure. case in the White House. I'm not sure. You're not sure that you're speaking out of bias. You're not being objective in your argument, here, sir. <laughs> you're not sure there's a nutcase in the White House. Okay, no, next question. Not, That's no, not you're, question. Not, you're, not, you're not making sense, Chuck. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, you aren't. Okay. Um, I believe that. <coughs> I believe that everything is a fiat value because gold goes from thirty-five dollars an ounce to two thousand dollars an ounce, back to twelve hundred. The dollar with respect to gold fluctuates. Everything on the planet is a fiat value. Gold, currency, everything. Am I mistaken? No, what you're saying is more wrong in the sense that things are uh, things are incrementing, so it's it's going to have like a fiat uh, element behind it. The value of anything is just what people will pay for. It's a fiat. Yeah, but... The thing, but as I was explaining earlier, the thing that goes in is that you and I can have can establish our own rate at what um, price we want to exchange the value. Uh, the for what could we do that? You don't make anything. I don't make anything. Gold, gasoline, oil, 
uh, dental work, whatever it is, none of us make that. We can't trade like we're doing, like we're trading, you know, ivory tusks from, uh, you know, from ancient artifacts. I mean, now, now, now you cannot trade, but at the time of the gold standard, you could because. The thing with the gold standard is that the government did not need necessarily to be involved. To my, original, my original question is, I believe everything on the planet is of fiat value, even gold. What do you say? I say that I disagree. You think gold has a value set by God? No, not by God, but what I'm saying is that the government does not need to set its value. We can, because the point of the gold standard is that the government doesn't interfere in the exchange that we are making. Because we fear the government is the one that actually declaring whatever value everything is. With the gold standard, it's not the case. That's why I say that I disagree. This girl hasn't had a question yet. Yes, ma'am. Um, I look at money, which is something I don't understand and which runs everything. We're all dependent on money, and money is something that we all scramble after and want. And we have faith that it has a value. And um, we also um, don't understand it, but really want it. Uh, these are just points that I would like to distinguish from the worship of God. Now, we worship God for the same reasons that we use money. And I wonder if you would comment on our the, the, the mysterious nature of money and the mysterious nature of the universe and God. Um, I, I need a minute. I, I've got to okay. That should be easy. <laughs> If you'd like, I can answer it for you. All right, I'll do with this. All right. It's, it's very simple. There's a reason we have faith in the dollar. It's because I can go take this $20 bill and walk out of here with a paid-for meal. We trust it because it works, and it goes back and forth. With, with faith in a higher being, you also attribute that to the same type of thing, but in a lot of cases, a lot of people are disputing of that because they don't see the immediate payoff. Faith in the money supply and the dollar basically is because everybody has it. You can go in and you can pay for goods and services, write a check, pay for goods and services, and you know what, it works. That's the difference between faith in the dollar and religious faith. Thank you. Say, easy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, right. Okay. So one of the things no, that is uh, the U.S. dollar value is that it's the only currency lawful for the payment of tax. So it creates an uh, inherent market for the dollar. But whatever commodity you're trading in, you have to convert the dollar to earn the tax. The Libertarian Party has a platform that they want to do away with all... No, we can't hear it. <coughs> Just speak up. So what I'm saying is this. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. All right. You, one of the things that gives the U.S. dollar value is that it's the only legal tender lawful for the payment of tax. Whatever currency you're trading in, you need to convert to dollars to pay your taxes. So there is an inherent market for the U.S. dollar. The Libertarian Party has a platform that suggests they want to do away with all legal tender laws. So how would you suggest, or what do you think of that platform of doing away with all legal tender laws, uh, you know, keeping in mind that there has to be some uniform uh, system of payment for tax? Okay. All right, are you ready? Yeah. Why are you just So what I would say in the first place is say uh, it's the denationalization of money. So if we get to denationalize the money and proceed by a free banking system, then yes. Because if we do a free banking system, although you can establish the interest rate at, uh, to which you want to 
borrow money, all the banks at the end of the day will still be able to work on the same page. So at the same at the same pace and establish the same interest rate that they want for the customers to borrow money. So I think that they yeah, are doing free banking and denationalizing the, um, the value of money would work. That's John. Now, am I correct what I just heard? The Libertarian Party <laughs> doesn't want to use money to pay taxes. They would rather use something else, like show up with, what, like fruit you grew in your backyard or something? I mean, what the fuck? Using money. Isn't that the job, right? <laughs> well, uh, is there any other political yes, party West. that is advancing this? Last week, Trump said he wanted to buy Greenland. How would that affect the economy? You can't use money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it will depend on the budget that he wants to invest in it, in the Greenland he wants to buy. Because if he wants to buy Greenland from the, uh, by using the government, we're the one basically paying for, for the Greenland that he's talking about. So if, I believe it depends on the budget that he wants to invest. That what would, you, what would we do with the inhabitants? Would they become U.S. citizens? Mm -hmm. They'll have to cross the border. Oh. It's owned by Denmark right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, All right, Pat Butler, mom, you haven't yeah, had a question. This Pat sounds, asked a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this sounds like uh, chaos waiting to happen. Is there a way of establishing a little more stability and a little more, because right now, from the way you describe it and others describe it, I mean, all hell could break loose on Wall Street or wherever, any time. Is there a way that we can handle this thing uh, where we have a little more of a handle on the whole business of money? Or, you know, we have another chaotic uh, event, like a recession or a depression or, you know, whatever, revolution. Uh, how, do we, how do we stabilize this so that people don't have to uh, stay up at night worrying about uh, whether their bank account is still going to be there? So, the thing with recessions is that, unfortunately, they are part of human life. They always happen. But... The question is, how severe is the recession? So if the more the economy is deregulated, the less it will affect the aggregate people involved in the economy. Because when a recession happens, it's mainly one branch of the market that is, that, that is declining, but at the same time, there's another market that is being created somewhere. So. I think uh, the thing with the recession is that what we can basically do is to deregulate the economy. The more we deregulate it, the less it will affect people as a whole. Because the more it is regulated, it's all of us who, who will be paying the price of the recession. Okay. Yes, sir. I mean, my impression is that the the dollar, having it pinned to the dollar, gives us as a nation power and hegemony over the world, right? I mean, isn't there, I mean, why, do, why is it the dollar? I mean, why couldn't it be more international, um, more more universal, um, more, more kind of, I mean, that the deregulation ideal could be managed, right? Because I think there's, and we can do things for warfare almost. America wants to I think the question is, why is the dollar important to everyone? Why? What? Why is the dollar important to everyone? Why is the dollar? Why is the dollar the? Yeah, hold on. Yeah. Well, why is the dollar used for? Yeah, yeah, right. We kind of grabbed it, I think. Back, I mean, it's. You know, um, I mean, it's because everyone trusts the dollar in the first place. That you're in the end. And also based on wars, too. The U.S. has been at war uh, since it was created. There were small wars, big wars. But when the U.S. was involved in even the continental wars, the way that they had to finance the, to subsidize the, the wars actually increased the value of the currency. So if you look at, for example, World War I, 
uh, he was, was among the winners of World War I, and World War II as well gave actually that, Egypt, that hegemonious power to the United States to actually take control international trade and whatever country wants to emerge and who, who is screwing up their, their economy. So basically, uh, all the countries start to take their debt from the dollar from the United States and from the dollar, because they trust the dollar as a more suitable currency to, um, to do international trade and exchange. But isn't it a way for us to abuse our power and almost create more wars? We get IMF and World okay. Bank, get them in oh, debt, boy. and, um, right. and who's winning? Is the bankers winning? And all the people, like China, all right, let's move I on. think... I mean, why not China? Why, why does China's a more powerful, sound economy than we are, right? Why don't we use them as our, our fiat? Uh, I don't think you want to use the UN as your fiat. The UN? Do you don't, do you don't want to use that? Nah. China, right? Or okay, let's move on. No, you don't want to use China. Okay, Jamal, I'm making a decision. So Order. Move on to the next question, please. Next this question. This gentleman. Please. Yes, sir. There's a world of difference between currency and credit. Now, you're talking about a gold-backed currency, but the economy runs on credit. How does credit exist in a gold-backed environment? So basically, credit exists on a gold-backed environment because of the, re of the redeemability. So because at the time of the gold standard, there was still also paper money. But since the paper money only had value based on the gold standard, if people had a check or they buy whatever they want, and they can go and to go to the commercial banks and redeem that money for a set amount of gold. So that's how they were created credits as well. OK. She had a question, then he had a question. This lady yes. here. What? The game behind you, little no. Oh, OK. Good. We'll get you next yes, time. Okay, what's the relation between the petrol dollar and all of this? Saddam Hussein was selling um, oil for euros. Look what happened to him. Okay, and um, Venezuela, what was his name? I forget the guy's name. Chavez. He was, he was trading oil for uh, Brazil, for, uh, for sugar. Gaddafi, Muhammad Gaddafi wanted to have a gold-based, look what happened to him. So, now, look, even if we bomb every country in the world, the oil is going to go, is going to be replaced by renewables, what are we going to do? The wall that Trump puts between the uh, United States and Mexico won't be high enough to keep me from jumping over it to look for something to eat. So tell us about the petrol dollar and all of this. Yeah. Okay. So what I can say is that the petrol dollar is in fact a form of threat to the hegemonious power of the United States. A form of what? Threat. So because if, for instance, if we take the case of Gaddafi, if he was able to, uh, to implement the, the gold dinar, people will start trusting more the dinar than the dollar. So the dollar will have a strong competitor to, to face. So now do I agree with whatever happened to Gaddafi? No, I don't. But I would say that to maintain the monetary power that the United States has over the world, it tries to attenuate the petrol dollar that you were talking about by preventing some leaders to create some form of... <laughs> That's what happened when we have all the weapons. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, under, under Jimmy Carter, the CD rate was six, was 16%. Now it's like 0.16. I mean, what happened? 16% with a CD rate. Now they don't pay anything. What happened? <laughs> yeah. Whoa. The people don't get yeah. the interest rates. The people's savings don't. There's no, no high interest or incentive. Yeah. No market for. Don't have a straight answer. Does, and isn't it the with the Bureau of Economics? There's one group that like 
Milton Friedman, and they say this is the people that know what the what inflation is and what make all these decisions, right? What is it called? The economic something committee? I forget. But, I know Mr. Yeah. Flo was uh, economic advisor for Reagan. Yeah. Right. But right. I don't know if he was necessarily part of the special uh, if he was part of the Parallel yeah. Society. Yeah. My last um, there's a Bureau of Economic Affairs or something like that, right? Um, and my question is. Here. Did they weigh, un, you know, undue influence, I think, over almost the history and our understanding of economics, say the Chicago School? It's fine, I wasn't. I mean, they've been teaching everything for the last hundred years, and it seems like they're kind of making it up to benefit themselves. Um, you know, is it, you've got to look at them critically. Is, is there something critical? I mean, is it a false choice, gold or... Or fiat. I mean, as somehow you could ask a, okay. a bigger question about how yeah, economics should line. be All right. before Milton Friedman, before the Federal Reserve. All right. I can say that usually the economy is a cycle. Right? Things always. Move. Were you trained in economics, a particular school of thought? Um, Me personally? Yeah. Uh -huh. No, I mean, I, I'm basically, study? I study politics. Where? Catholic University of America and George Washington mm -hmm. in DC. Mm -hmm. No, I mean I don't have a uh, formal education in economics. It's I taught myself economics and I align more with the Austrian school than, than the Chicago school. But Austrian school, right? What about LaRouche? Are you familiar with his economics uh, or Marxist let's economics? Let's uh, move on if we have. I mean, to. I know so Why, much. When I say it, you move on, okay? Just chill, Tim, okay? You've just because you're more, not my fucking you've auditor more time than of who else. talks, okay? So just stop playing monitor. Thank you. You work the camera and I'd shut like up. I like to talk as soon as I can. Yeah, One full at a time. I don't want to get sick. I, it's uh, no patriarchy. personal attacks. It's, it's, it's chauvinism. And it's called hogging the time on questions. Me, but he just All called right. on me. You're opposing your capitalist bullshit on us. It's no, it's called We're sharing time. There's no rush. I was called on here. I had my hand up. One second. One second. I'll moderate for the rest of the time here. It's getting a little ragged. Okay. <laughs> I gotta go get him a beer. What about Marxist economics? Do you have any opinion? What do they think? Is it just gold versus fiat? I believe it was my turn. I haven't finished mine. Okay, so sit down and shut up. <laughs> <laughs> he just called it. Okay, he's the guy. Mr. President. He called on me again, okay? My turn. Uh, I've been right. shut down five times here. Okay, so just sit down. Let's make it six. We'll make it six. Okay, fuck you all. Go ahead, ask your stupid question. <laughs> I'm sick of that bullshit. You're a good stand up comedian. I'm, I'm going to answer your question, Dave, and then I'll be right back. Okay. All right, let's play. So, to answer your question, ma'am, um, if it comes to if it comes to Marx and economics, I would say that they would be more in favor of uh, fiat money because yeah, we got to keep it down. We got people from in there That's what Marx and economics is going on. They want total control of the economy and of economic activities. I don't know about that. Or do you have an? Yeah, there's a dialectical method, or that is more. Larouche talks about things that are not I mean, necessarily. I'm, I'm not necessarily. Maybe it's for the people, all the people collectively, not just the bankers. What is for the people? Well, what is fair? What what makes the economy grow? You know what? It, look at it scientifically. I Right. Everyone wants to have a favorite term. Well, let him go. Let him go. Dave, you step next, please. Uh, my question was and is uh, would you speak to Ludwig von Mises? If I would speak to him or with him? Will you speak on about him? Oh, about him, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but what do you want me to exactly yeah. emphasize on? Uh, the Austrian school. Yes, I mean, like, do you have a specific question about the Austrian school? 
Summarize the Austrian school. Okay, so basically the Austrian school believe that uh, we do not need the government to be involved in economic activities, even to the point that sometimes that's where there's some mm. Austrians who believe in anarcho-capitalism. They believe that the government should not even regulate the military, the judiciary, and the police. I'm not personally an anarchist, but <coughs> I can understand why they think that way. But back to Mrs. Mrs. basically saying that if we let people pursuing their own self-interest without any form of third-party interference, eventually people will grow the economy because since they're pursuing the profit, they are doing a voluntary exchange with the people that they are, uh, they are conveying their activities with. So that's what Mises believe. He believe that the government should in no way intervene in any form of economic activity whatsoever. I believe that it's up to the people to basically create whatever market, because the market is a spontaneous order, so whatever market they can create it that can generate profit and revenues, people should go for it. That's how it helps um, the economy or the or society as a whole to move forward. Yes, but should, should, didn't the should. Austrian school hold that money is gold and gold is money? Yeah, they do. They do believe. Uh, Mrs. was actually a strong proponent of the gold standard. Although there were some people in the Austrian school that did not necessarily agree with him, but Mrs. personally was a strong proponent of the gold standard. Should we have a currency with Trump's picture in it? <laughs> I don't think so, no. <laughs> Too early. <laughs> no, no, I don't think so, no. Charlie, you got one in the back for a minute. Yeah. All right, all right, Charlie. Yeah, yeah. He, you said the money, at the conclusion, you think that uh, the money is not backed by anything, by, by nothing. The money per previous speaker here at the college from the current exchange stated that the money is in fact by the confidence in the U.S. economy. Yes. And doesn't that make a more modern, realistic approach than this thing of trying to empty? And, I mean, we are in an electronic world. Wealth is transferred electronically. And it, the, the events of the past week, if anything, demonstrated that the confidence in the United States economy is determines the economy almost of the world now. And the gold would have nothing to do, no influence on the events of the past week and the discussion of uh, recession and so forth. So, I don't perceive what gold has to do with anything. Okay. And so no effect since we left it, it effectively in 1934. Okay. Could you rephrase your question, Charlie? What do we need this gold standard at all for? It has had no effect last week or in the past decade. No so, bearing whatsoever on the economy of the world. So yes, we are the stronger economy in the world, but any economy can collapse at any time. And that's a problem. And if the US economy collapses for whatever reason, the dollar will lose its will lose its, its value instantly. Well look, has the dollar ever has the economy collapsed? <laughs> because of this money gold? Thing, never. No, but with the gold standard, it would be hard. Never. With the gold standard, it would be hard for the economy to collapse subsequently. It would be hard for for money to lose its value. But with fiat, money can lose its value at any time. I can give you, for instance, uh, the example of Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe had fiat money as well. They were using the Zimbabwean dollar. They overprint their money. And today, they need to spend trillions of dollars just to buy a loaf of bread. I'm talking about the United States. Yeah, but the, point, but, the but the point is... Zimbabwe. Yeah, but the point is, the United States is also run by men, like Zimbabwe is run, is run by so men. So in 1934, you can have to show us how your theories on gold have 
saved us or hurt us or anything. It's not that it has saved us. It's, it's just that we had the Great Depression and FDR. It has and nothing F to do with gold. No, it doesn't have to, no, it has nothing to do with gold. Let's move on. Don't, don't, yeah. don't okay. Gold. All right. Uh, I just want to point out, gold is, is something you, as, as a currency, as good anywhere in the world, pretty much, right? I mean, you can go somewhere with dollars, it won't work for you, but if you had gold, it would work for you. Yeah, you can, you can redeem. Like silver or gold will work. I mean, yeah, you can so redeem that at any time. It's got a value everywhere, where a dollar may not have a value. Yes, sir. Um, the, uh, paper currency is a relatively new invention, okay? Um, paper currency is a relatively new invention. All right. If you go back to Rome, to Greece, Egypt, probably I don't know, um, China. Okay, everybody had coins, not paper money. And if they had coins, they were silver coins or some other coin. No. No, Charlie. No. Okay. Because I, my my question was, if all the coins were of precious metals. Then what happened to their, how did their economies get out of control? Charlie's saying that's a mistake. My question is, if before paper money came, came into being, everything was a currency, and the currencies were a precious metal, then why was there catastrophes, financial failures, and everything else that we, that we have today? I mean, as I say, like catastrophes, recessions, they always happen because we're human beings. This is stuff that no matter how we try to prevent them, it will eventually happen somehow. And they happen, they happen because they happen because it enables to create not just new ideas, but new market as well. It's important that Sometimes recessions happen so that new markets could be created because if there's never if there's no recessions at all Things will still be the same and they will and they will be stagnant and we don't want stagnation Yes Okay, my question is um, I don't get the separation of economic activity from the government and I would like to know what um, what are the political leanings of the people in Austria and in the United States who believe in the gold standard and is there I mean this is a political stance it's to say that we should have a gold standard is a political stance and so uh, I'd like you to uh, elaborate on how politics can be separated from the economy. Um, so with the gold standard, politics could be separate from the economy, although uh, advocating for the gold standard is a form of political rhetoric. Uh, it is because as I said, with the gold standard, the government does not need to interfere in the production of money necessarily. So, so yes, other sir. people have been able to ask all of these questions. But um, Marx was a student of political economy. Now, to me, politics and the economy are inextricably combined. Now, so I, you know, I'll tell you what my suspicion is. I'll tell you what my suspicion is. This is not anything that I know. I suspect that people in Austria who are really avid about the gold standard are Nazis. You said they're not what? Nazis. They're not Nazis. So they are Nazis. They are. Nazis. I think they are. That's her suspicion. That's my. That's my suspicion. Okay. Let's just wait a minute. She asked separating politics from the economy. This is the thing uh, I thought Thank we were going to talk about tonight. The Federal Reserve System up, operates as separate banks. 
libertarians all know this, with some autonomy from the U.S. government. And therefore they say that's not right. Those are other people that say that's good, you shouldn't have the political, too much in politics influencing the economy. It depends on which side you're on. The okay. Reserve has some independence. Well, that just came out in the congressional hearing where the guy asked the thing. He said, if the president ordered you to do this, would you do it? And he'd say, you know, I, can he fire you? And they have fixed terms of office, things like that. It's to give some degree of separation. Okay. All right. I, yeah. I think that's a great point. I mean, what is the effect of them being private? Could it be that... They're not a government. They sound like a government. Most people think they are federal, but they're not. They're they're a private. And I, from what you hear on the internet, they that means they can't be regulated. There's no transparency. They don't tell what the records are. The director of the Federal Reserve then went over to the Bank of Israel. The the other guy, the Bank of International Settlements, is part of you. Russia, one of the ones that is involved, and so there's a lot of dirty dealing, and I, yeah. if you don't have a hypothesis and investigate these guys, they well, can get away with kleptocracy, okay. basically. Okay, let's All right. stop. Yeah. Yeah. We should go to rebuttals fairly soon, because I think $21 trillion debt. Well, I don't have time for the question. You, you got a question? Yeah. If you got a question, go ahead. No, she has it yet. Then, then, uh, after this last question, we'll, we'll go to rebuttals to give everybody okay. enough time to get to the Go ahead and ask your question. That's okay with you. I don't, I don't understand what Bitcoin cyber currency is. I can Google it. You don't have to completely. But is it a part of the gold standard and fiat money, or is it a contender, or is it? It's a contender, basically. And, yeah, it's nothing to do with the gold it, standard or fiat Is it money. struggling? Um, uh, no, actually, it's growing. Okay. No, Bitcoin, cri uh, cryptocurrency, it's, it's growing. Okay, let's have a show of hands here. Who would like to? <laughs> <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, okay. six, seven, probably ten people. Looks about uh, yeah. about four we'll minutes. We'll start with five minutes. Four minutes each, and four uh, minutes. maybe a little longer, depending. It looks like we got at least ten people tonight. Give our right. speaker a hand for a good. Thank you, Germano. Yeah. Appreciate you speaking. Is there anybody sitting here? Okay. Nobody's sitting here, right? You're the first. Up. You got up to make a speech. Yeah. Who's sitting here? All right, let's uh, let's give our rebutters the same edge, the same uh, the same courtesy as our speaker. <laughs> Can I please have your attention? Uh, good evening. Uh, I'd like to say that what makes me angry, particularly, is that is a bad promise. My young um, all right. Parents and my family knew better than to make a promise to me that they couldn't keep or not keep because all hell would break loose. I don't like to be promised something and then have that promise broken. The, uh, it used to be that banks had to, would hold the gold and they would print money and people would carry around cash, uh, paper money, in order to have the convenience of not being weighed down by sacks of gold. <coughs> and later the government said, let us hold your gold, and we'll print the money, and we'll guarantee everything, and you can have your gold any time you want it. One fool at a time, please. Huh? Hello? Uh, then, later, when the government had most of the gold in their possession, they then said, well, we're just going to print the money and we won't allow anyone to have their gold yeah. there. And they made it against the law for individuals to own gold. Now, that was a dirty double cross and a bad promise. It never happened. Furthermore, Furthermore, uh, I'm not going to be heckled, Charlie. 
I demand that you stop doing that. Well, oh, one full okay? time. I demand. Enough already with you. You do it every time. I've had enough. As far as fiat money is concerned, France tried it with a thing called the South Sea Bubble, and it ruined France. Uh, China had tried it, and they lost out. All countries that used fiat money went to hell and eventually had to come back to using gold, gold uh, uh, currency that was backed by gold. What's more, uh, gold, uh, uh, there, there is a book that I would highly recommend to everyone here called Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. And it talks about how certain things had the prices driven way up. It even talks about the tulip bulb mania in Holland and uh, how the different countries had different kinds of fiat currencies and how that they all, the only one that ever held firm was gold. And I'm going to mention as a final thing here is that the Soviet Union had money that they distributed among their people. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, so did the money. And if you talk to any Russian, or talk now to any Russian who was there at the time, they will tell you that it was like a big joke. They started wallpapering their bathrooms with paper of uh, Soviet currency. I rest my case. Attaboy, Dave. Attaboy, Dave. Whatever you want to do. <laughs> All right. Wow. So, so it's very, very, very hard to separate money from people. Okay? Impossible. So, here's what goes on. You have fiat money, which, which on one side of the coin means it's like it has no intrinsic value. All right, and then you have on the other side of the coin something called the gold standard. All right, also has no intrinsic value. The value of gold is defined by whatever people will pay for it, and it's a it's a market that's at the moment worldwide. Okay, no one sets it, no one manipulates it. It's extraordinarily large. Okay, now history of the United States. Industrial Revolution takes hold in Britain and expands to the United to the United States. The United States, oh my God, all this land starts building railroads, using the railroads to start moving goods around. The country is growing astonishingly fast, except it has a gold-backed currency. Okay, and the currency can't keep up with the gold, with the, with the growth of the economy. And we have deflation, and we have farmers losing money. All right? And we have people screaming about the fact that there's deflation. And what the farmers are borrowing in the spring, they have to pay back with more in the fall because there's deflation. All right? Now, what happened, luckily, with the United States was, what was it, 1849? The gold rush in California? And they had the gold rush where they were able to mine to discover the gold that, a lot, that kept up with the growth of the economy. Wow, lucky. Then what happens? The economy keeps growing, things are doing well. Things are not doing well. There's panics all over the place, okay? But we have the Alaska gold mine, and all of a sudden we have enough currency to keep up with the economy. And the, the inflexibility of the gold standard to keep up with a growing economy Right now, today, we have an economy that is not even based on material things. Oh, the guy who was chairman of the Federal Reserve in the 90s, he had, he had, he wrote several books, one of them I read, and he said that in, as chairman of the Federal Reserve, he asked all of his, all of the PhDs that were on the staff to weigh, weigh 
the GDP of the United States from 1900 on to wait. What in the world? And they did it. So what they found out was that in 1900, the U.S. GDP weighed whatever in the world it was, but it was based on steel, oil, timber, lumber, farm goods, cotton, tobacco, everything that was real. And as time went on, the GDP weighed less and less. And today, we have a company like Facebook, which is a huge company. Google, which is a huge Amazon, huge. All right, IBM, not so huge. All right, we have huge companies and huge parts of the economy that don't weigh hardly anything. It's all in the mind. It's all ideas. All right. So now we have an economy that is growing beyond physical reality. All right, an economy that's growing on ideas. All right, and how? Does the gold standard keep up with that? And that's the problem with the gold standard. The economy needs flexibility. The other problem with the gold, but the problem with fee money is it's easily abused. Okay? Could be right. Thanks, Germano, for your presentation. Um, I think it's a very important topic the economy, our money. Okay, it's obviously very important to all of us. <clears throat> I read uh, this book, uh, The Creature from Jekyll Island, I think Ellen mentioned that in passing, by Edward Griffin, and I looked into um, some of these uh, issues with money and, and the gold standard and, and with other sources in addition. But that book I, I would highly recommend. And what it shows is that um, the Federal Reserve was uh, really one of the biggest scams uh, in American history. Okay. It was literally, okay, you all know that I'm into conspiracies, right? Well, this was literally a conspiracy. Uh, the, uh, the Morgans and the Rockefellers, or their representatives, okay, literally met on an island off the coast of Georgia and uh, designed the Federal Reserve, to obviously, to enrich themselves further, okay? Not for the benefit of the American people. So uh, it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a bad deal, and it leads to a number of problems. Uh, I think you unfortunately glossed over these problems. Um, there's the concentration of wealth in the hands of the rich. This is uh, in part due to the Federal Reserve and, and getting out the gold standard and using fiat money. The government at now, uh, and the people that control the government, okay, can manipulate the currency, they manipulate inflation rates, they manipulate banking, every which way, in ways that we don't even know, or none, not many of us know, because it's very complicated. They work in the shadows, okay? So they benefit themselves, and that leads to the dominance of bankers. What the hell do bankers actually do for us, okay? Mm -hmm. They have a whole lot of money, and they make themselves even more money. The trillions and trillions, Google, I mean, uncountable amount, uh, amounts of money, all right? They suck us dry. The, the, the uh, wealth of the American people itself uh, uh, has not risen for, for decades, all right? For, for many decades. And then inflation. <laughs> Um, from what I understand, is a form of theft, all right? Uh, uh, stealing from the American people, and we don't get ahead. The, the rich people get richer and richer and richer, as we should know by now. So it's a, it's a huge problem. Uh, and uh, I wish you, uh, you would have gotten into fractional reserve banking, okay? That's a big part of this whole discussion about money and, and, and gold. Uh, interest is being paid to the economic elite, all right? Uh, and for what, for doing what exactly? They they literally banks literally make money out of nothing. They, they they press buttons on their computers and literally make money out of nothing when they when they give credit. Okay. Now uh, I'm not conversant enough to you know go off on, on that, and I don't even have to, I wouldn't have time anyway. But when you look into these things, they manipulate our money and currency and our economy, left, right, up and down in every which way for their own purposes. All right. So we have to. Get, a, get some control over this. And that's why I advocate uh, actual democracy in which the people would actually control our economy and our money.
So the first thing I want to say is I think people who oppose the Federal Reserve, whether they're on the right or the left, can get along. Because if you're on the left and you're against the Federal Reserve, that means more congressional control over our monetary policy. And if you're on like the libertarian right and you're against the Federal Reserve, that just means that, you know, give it back, give that policy making authority back to the Congress and then maybe abolish that and then give that back to the market to let people decide which is the best currency they want to use. So I'm going to turn this to elections for a sec. When they review election results, they're like, we need to check it out, like we need to do the hand count of the ballot, the hand recount. Um, and then they verify the e-voting, they, they check out the electronic results. And those are used to, you know, make sure, those are used to verify each other. They're a check against each other. In the same way that a check between the judiciary, the executive, and the legislative, there's checks against each other. So think of the gold standard as a check against, or a, you're hedging your bet against uh, government currency failing. In the same way that using government currency hedges your bet against the gold standard failing. We, we need some degree of market and government um, solutions to our problems in case one fails, in case the government collapses or in case the economy collapses, or if the economy is not allowed to cleanse itself through uh, recessions every once in a while. So and I, I just wanted to speak to how, yeah, it, it is a real problem, like fiat currency versus gold currency is kind of a false dichotomy, and there are a lot of alternative um, currencies out there. There's uh, cryptocurrency, which I don't think Bitcoin or the gold standard is perfect. If we have cryptocurrency, like, it has blockchain, so it has that verifiability. Any person who has um, a cryptocurrency can, you know, can find out anything they want to. It's kind of like a credit union. There's some transparency in that uh, in that currency system. So aside from cryptocurrency, there's other things like there's an in individual scientist named Josiah Warren um, in the 19th century in Ohio who um, started the Cincinnati Time Store, and they would trade labor hours. They would have labor hours with our currency. And uh, there's another thing called mount mountain hours. It's a labor-backed currency. Um, in Colorado, there's things called time banks and time dollars. Look up a thing called a mutuum check, uh, which is kind of like a combination of check and promissory note and currency and a contract all in one. There's digital social credit, um, and there's like the potlatch, the Indian potlatch. That's the way to avoid a need for currency and money at all. So I, I do think we can do without money and currency, but when it comes to the gold standard versus fiat currency, I see them both as hedging bets against the risk of each other failing, but I, I see how the gold standard could work. I see how we could reduce our need for physical money um, in a way that we could get the gold that exists to represent the wealth that's out there that people need to exchange. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thanks. Hey, let's hear it for Germinal. Yeah. Let's hear it for Dave Travis. <laughs> yeah. Yay. Uh, Michael Bednarik, who ran for uh, president, uh, he was the LP's nominee in 2004. He uh, he has an anecdote that kind of like explains um, uh, inflation for somebody who might not understand what it is. Basically, you have uh, a finite amount of a currency. Let's say me and Tim each have 50 percent of it. Uh, if they print uh, more currency out of thin air, uh, let's say they double the amount, instead of me and Tim each having 50%, we now have a quarter. So uh, that's in a way like stealing. Um, and that was how Michael Ben Dark explained it, and to me it made sense. Um, another thing that was, another item that was very good is uh, Ron Paul's In the Fed. It's a very good book. It's very like it's like 200 pages. Um, it's very it's a good it's a good introduction to the issues with the Federal Reserve and why we need the gold standard. Um, so I highly recommend it. Um, I think Ed, you were I think Ed during the Q and A was you know said everything is fiat. I think another way I think another thing he was another way of rephrasing that would be that value is subjective, right? That's actually an Austrian economics uh, sort of tenet. Uh, Karl Menger was the first person to uh, explain that. Uh, and now there's a, an even more technical economic term for it. Um, but that is actually, yes, you're right. And, and Austrian gold bugs believe, yes, that everything in value is subjective. Um, let's hear it for Charlie. Yeah. 
Charlie uh, is nice enough to uh, let me come in on the 21st to do a presentation, Libertarian Meme Stash. It'll be a uh, slideshow. I'll have images of libertarian themed memes. You guys will have a great time. Thank you. All right, next. So I, uh, I want to take a moment to emphasize that once again, the Libertarian Party has it right. Uh, no legal tender at all. Value is in the eye of the beholder. Like, what's a dollar worth? It's worth whatever somebody will give you for it. What's a piece of gold worth? It's worth, worth whatever somebody will give you for it. What's a Bitcoin worth? It's worth whatever somebody will give you for it. The free market establishes the meaning of exchange. As far as a store of value goes, what, what is value? I mean, it's, it doesn't matter. If you have a free market in currency, you don't have centralized control. You don't have people who decide how much money to issue and how much money to not issue, who to give it to, who not to give it to. You allow the free market to decide. When it comes to the payment of tax, <coughs> Taxes can be paid in gold and silver, so anybody trading in any currency or any medium of exchange will have to buy gold or silver to pay their tax. That's it. And then otherwise, currency can be free-floating. You don't need centralized control over the issuance of currency. Any legal tender law should be abolished. Let people buy and sell with whatever they want to. So, once again, Libertarian Party nailed it. Thank you. By, by being unrealistic. <laughs> Adam Boyd, Brian. Thank you. You're a bad person. You have to us tonight, would you please? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what's left of us. Um, remember the days yeah. when uh, there was the expression, sound as a dollar. That was in the days when we had, I believe, uh, still uh, we were using the uh, gold standard. I don't know about you, but I kind of like to know that uh, my world is not going to be gone tomorrow morning just because a couple people decide that we're going to do away with all sorts of controls. And therefore, we have this, this, this nebulous world where it can change in a minute. Um, I don't know about you. I like my money in a bank that I know is going to be operating probably next week, next month, next year. Uh, I don't think this is going to happen in a uh, free-flowing world that uh, some people here seem to like. Uh, I think if you were to take a poll of most Americans I think we are fed up with the types of ups and downs. I think we want a certain amount of stability. I think you can't plan a business. You can't plan a government. You can't plan your own world without that kind of certainty or near certainty. Now, faith is good at 10 o'clock in the morning at your local church or synagogue. It is not necessarily good if you are being asked to live under an economic system that, such as bitcoins, that have not been tried and true. Down, down through the ages, going back to the days of the Caesars and before, who coined the money? The money was coined by Caesar. The money was coined by the Rome, the Romans. Uh, you know, the the money was coined by governments because governments were likely to be there. They were likely to be able to, in everyone's interest, particularly the ruling class, in everyone's interest, they were likely to be watchful that certain uh, you know craziness was not. What happened? Example. What happened after World War I when this, the Weimar Republic, which was the poorest excuse for a government that could be found anywhere up until what came later, 
uh, people were going shopping with baskets full of money. And you wanted to do it early in the morning because if you didn't, those baskets full of money were going to be worthless by six o'clock, seven o'clock in the evening. This, you know, this is, uh, this is not a fairy tale. There are people still alive today who remember in Germany, and I think the same thing happened in China, uh, they, were, they remembered what happened when you had this chaotic situation and you had to do your shopping in the morning because by six o'clock, forget it, your money was worthless. Do we want this kind of uncertainty or do we want, I mean frankly from what I can gather, I think I probably would prefer that we go on the gold standard because it gives people something solid to turn to. Uh, as far as acts of faith, uh, that's fine at 10 o'clock in the morning at your local church or synagogue. Uh, I like certainty. I always have. Uh, and I think a lot of Americans feel that same way. Uh, Bitcoins, um, hey, I could stand on a street corner and, uh, you know, try to uh, pass out uh, money uh, that I coined in my basement. And what is going to happen? Two things. A lot of people are just going to stand and laugh. A few poor suckers are going to uh, buy some of these coins. And more likely, the U.S. Secret Service is going to arrest me later that day. And uh, I don't blame them. Because their job is to watch out for counterfeit money and uh, you know other acts uh, committed against the currency. And we need this. We need this for a kind of a certainty that we can do business, that we can go about our lives, that we don't have to worry. We don't have to worry, you know, the ideal thing is if we could find a way, and I asked this earlier, that we could find a way to somehow control the situation so that every few years we don't have to worry about another recession. I believe it can be done. Yeah, I'm not an economist. But I believe we will eventually reach a point where we'll be able to exercise the right kind of controls that will enable us to uh, do business without fear and will enable us to be sure that the money that we do have is not going to evaporate in the morning. I guess that's all I have to say because uh, my ramblings, and they are ramblings, is simply because of the fact, like most Americans, I think I am terribly scared when you throw the operations of our money in the hands of amateurs. And when I hear Bitcoin and other things like that, I see amateurs. Thank you. Thank you, Germano, for an interesting talk. Time is a lie, money a myth. It's not who we are, just how we live. The system's a cauldron full of hate and lies. We search for our sheroes and heroes, but now realize that they're not some other where, not some other time. They are right here all around, <coughs> now you and I. A couple of dollars an hour, dozens of dollars a day, hundreds of dollars a week, because zero would be too obvious. A flake and jan an hour, handful of grains of sand a day, some blades of grass a week, because a ghost still needs a spell to cast. I imagine you know that I am much more socialistic in my economic theory than capitalistic. Capitalism started out with a noble and high motive, but like most human systems, it fell victim to the very thing it was revolting against. So today, capitalism has outlived its usefulness. That's Martin Luther King Jr. So um, there's a lot of big ticket items recently in our history where we're all asking the same question, uh, when are we going to get our money back? Whether it's the Iraq war or the $15 trillion of a waste, fraud, and abuse of 2007-2008 collapse or the tax breaks for the rich or the most costly of them all, ecocide of the biosphere. Um, 
I'm really glad you gave this talk tonight, and I hope you come back and talk about it more because I'm looking very much forward to the day where we have a standard that there's no name for yet that if I were to be as ridiculous as possible, I would name that standard the Civilization Standard. Thank you, German. All right. All right. I will open with not a joke, which is a good thing to open with, but with a question. Does anyone know why men have buttons on their sleeves? Because their hand is bigger than their wrist. I know why. Why? Because the king saw one of his guards sneeze and he wiped his nose with his sleeve. That's right. So he ordered that buttons be put on the sleeve, so if he did it again, it would hurt his nose. That's exactly, well, that's, wow. that's, that's what I, I, I have wow. heard too. Um, that, that goes back to my 1960s economics <coughs> class, the only economics I've had. Uh, Mr. Reedy told us that story, and I just was so fixated on that, I couldn't pay attention to the rest of the semester of economics. But, you know, theolog theology and money to me, are, they're just both too intangible. Um, I read theology and I say, what did I just read? And money, listening to your talk, is the same with me. I mean, I really don't understand this. What I, I do know is that we, as far as the gold standard, um, gold is a finite quantity. We saw a segment on TV the other night um, about how the miners in South Africa cannot go much deeper to mine. They're really deep. I don't remember how, how far it was. But there's a new fellow heading a, a gold mining company who thinks he can do it better. But it's really scary. They've been using like almost slave labor down there to get gold out. We just don't have enough gold and it's finite. And we're going to have more people and we need, need more money and we need more money to pay our debts in the country. I, I mean, I, I just don't get it. Oh, okay. Hold on. Okay, next. If not, I'll go ahead. Great. Now I'm going to probably lose out on money. How many money? Uh, probably going to lose out on money. I yeah, I'm Ellen Corley. I love this thing. And um, yeah, I want to, you know, apologize for losing my cool there. I've just uh, been frustrated um, with this subject in general. Uh, my, some of you know, my my stepfather was friends had raised me. I'm Milton Friedman and I and Rand. He, Alan Greenspan, I believed everything he said. And um, and then, you know, was a libertarian. Uh, and then I realized that they're big lies, really. And that shifting and looking at the other side of the coin, the left wing side, I guess, um, it, it really just explained more. Um, I mean, the theory of libertarian kind of makes sense. I'm a, you know, kind of an anarchist, freedom, free market. I mean, there's a lot of good words there, a lot of, it all makes sense. Uh, but then you really look at history and try to see it what it is, like Jefferson. Um, I, you know, what it comes down to is the currency is truth, you know? And if, if there is lies, which you come to see was, the driver of the big inflation in Hitler's time was that we were, you know, Rothschild bankers were financing both sides of the war. That's been what the Federal Reserve was about. They were financing Morgan and um, all those Jekyll Island guys. And they, you know, there's a, there's money in financing war in every country. Each of the brothers went to a different country and, you know, financed their wars of imperialism. And that's why Marx basically makes sense. Um, and that's why they had to silence him, pushing him out of countries. And that's what really gets me is the censorship, the public relations and marketing. They were invented, you know, the same time that they were pushing war. They, you know, put Jane Addams down and, you know, because she 
you know, cast dispersions on our fighting boys and said you had to get them drunk to kill each other. And that's the truth. PR, inflation, you know, the, the banks, um, you know, this idea that they're the experts and they're the, it just, um, it, it really is big lies. And as Hitler said, they're easier than the little ones, especially when you control the media. And you can, basic, and you control the education system. I mean, I was studying macroeconomics. I got my MBA, a teaching degree, and a master's in teaching. But I'm like, where's they stopped teaching macroeconomics because it became kind of inconvenient for students to be asking these questions. Like, does that really? Is that why you have the Federal Reserve to control inflation? Just needed well, then, um, like you said, where there is a lot of inflation, and it, you know, this idea that you control inflation when. What happened in Germany, the ultimate inflation was caused by you. You know, it's these are wars. It, there's a lot of money in war and, and banking and financing both sides of the wars, both sides of the election, because then you control the whole world for the new world order, which the Fourth Reich, which is what Hitler wanted and why he left his CIA and his jurist, Carl Schmidt, in charge of this. You know, create, divide, and conquer throw little terrorist things going, everybody will be afraid. You know, they'll give you all their control. And the truth is, you could say, it's all just the regulation of government that's bad. That was Milton Friedman did. But then what's worse, what fascism really is, is regulation by corporations that have captured the government and doing it for profit. You know, I mean, if you would re-regulate things rightly with honest services and a fairness doctrine in media that only truth is allowed and you don't get to be on the media like Fox News and just be bullshitting everybody, right? That's what's frustrating and it seems that without truth being the standard in our media, without you know having newscasters who are not pushing an ideological agenda i mean the the sad thing is the the difference between libertarian and anarchy uh, jesus was an anarchist and a skeptic the difference is that the right wing libertarians are pushing an agenda which is bankers make money and even you know thomas jefferson and washington who I am descended from, said, watch out for the banks and watch out for the party system. Because the thing is, with they have put, they corrupted every single banker there, has been paid by the lobbyists for the banks and for the, for Israel forever war. And I mean, oh yeah, what a joke that is, right? A laugh, laugh, laugh as they genocide the world. That communism isn't our problem, right? It really is capitalism has reached its last stage of imperialism yeah. and fascism. Yeah. And that yeah. is a real yeah. formula for world-ending disaster, exactly. right? That's what's going to cause this planet to, and nobody cares about truth here. And it does get frustrating because Andy Anderson and Ted and I are repeating ourselves and we're talking to blank walls here. Yes. And it, it makes you want to scream because you're not they're not hearing us. So That's because you're wrong. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> After this, I'm gonna make mine. Um, so uh, now it's time for a blank wall to say something. Okay. I Now, with the, uh, the benefit of hindsight and being uh, 60 years old, I remember when I was a kid, and uh, banks are pretty simple. Uh, they wanted you to open a savings account. They took your money, and they gave you a fair amount of interest. And they turn around, and they reinvest the money by lending it to people in the community, either businesses or homeowners. It's a pretty simple concept. And for some strange reason, that whole idea is upside down. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, and those are based on laws that are passed by people in Washington, and there are people in theory that we sent there. It's really a shame. I, I see the problems uh, with banks that um, in that, and, and this has been written about, I, I think most people already know this, but I think it's the, the crux of the problem is that uh, uh, banks have abandoned that old model. 
now they're investment institutions. They're, they're literally doing legalized gambling on the stock market. And to the, the crash of 2008 was the result of that, and there's a lot of talk that there aren't laws in place to prevent that from happening again. And this is, these are our banks. So, so that gives me uh, some cause for concern. Um, I wonder if anybody here, I, I just found this out, I'm, I'm, I'm not a genius, but I just found this out. I wonder if anybody else knows who the richest person in the world, who that person was. Yes. yes. In, in the history of mankind, based on, or on current Caesar. dollars, who the richest person was. Caesar. Caesar. Rockefeller. Caesar. Yeah, no, I haven't maybe. heard it yet. Yeah. It's, 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 the name is Jacob Fugger. Anybody say that? Is he alive today? He lived in the 1500s. Oh. He basically invented international banking. And because he invented it, he cornered the market and he was worth like close to a, to a, a trillion dollars in today's money. What's the name again? F-U-G-G-A-R. Fugger. Fugger. Okay. Fugger. Fugger. Right, so, Fugger, maybe, he was maybe a fugger. So. Um, but this is how, this is how he did, did, did I, I read a, a, a biography on him, it was fascinating because he was the most, one of the most powerful men in the world at a time when the most powerful people were kings. And this is how he literally had power over kings. Because kings were not good with money, and kings love to start wars. But you can't go to war if you can't pay your troops. So what do these kings go to? They go to the banker with all the money, and they borrow the money. And so they go to war, maybe they win, but then he's got these kings in his pocket. It is a fascinating story, but, but it has parallels today. It's like, why, why do people not really one the gold standard. I mean, look at all the wars that have been started and all the money we owe. I mean, the United States owes how much money to China? It's nuts. On the one hand, we're complaining about all the immense problems and this huge threat of this country, and at the same token, we're in their pocket. Like, what, what, is, what is wrong with this? What, what is, like, going on? I'm just not sure. I, it's like I see that as a big problem. I just... I just don't know how to stop it. Yeah. Excuse me. Yes. Can I ask a question? Go ahead. I'd like to ask, he asked you who the richest man was in the world. I'd like to ask, who is the most successful man in the world? <laughs> He's the man, your wife, could have married instead of you. <laughs> this issue, my friends, is not new. That doesn't sound too bad. As a matter of fact, back in 1893, this was one of the most hotly contested issues about the gold standard versus the free flow of government money. William Jennings Bryan became a really successful candidate for presidency because he advocated that the power to issue a currency should be in the exclusive partial of government and that the government should not be dependent upon the value of precious metals for its currency. What he did was he said, everybody's a businessman, whether you're a wage laborer or a farmer or an office worker, you all had to decide the value of money and have a common means of exchange. His biggest gripe was that privatizing money in the form of a bank or whatever could probably lead to more shenanigans. We have today a little bit more of a crossbreed of stuff. But you come to us and tell us the great cities are in favor of the gold standard. We reply that the great cities rest upon... Hey, don't block the camera, please. All right, I'll go again. My friends, we declare that this nation is able, you come to us and tell us that the great cities are in favor of the gold standard. We reply that these great cities rest upon the broad and fertile prairies. Burn down your cities and leave your farms, and your cities will spring up again as a fine magic. But destroy our farms and grass, 
will grow on the streets of every city in our country. My friends, we declare that this nation is able to legislate for its own people on every question without wanting for the aid or consent of any other nation on earth to rest upon the issue we expect to carry every state of the union. I will not slander the inhabitants of the fair state of Massachusetts, nor the states of New York. He continues to go on and give further arguments for abolishing the gold standards. And he concludes with a few words of this. No, my friends, this will never be the verdict of our people. Therefore, we care not upon what lines of battle we fought. If they say bimetallism is good, but that we cannot have it until other nations help us, we reply, then instead of having a gold standard, because England has, we will restore bimetallism. And then let England have bimetallism because of the United States has it. Basically, are we going to adopt the world standards or not? If they dare to come out in an open field and defend the gold standard as a good thing, we will fight them to the uttermost. Having behind us the producing masses from the nations of this world, supported by commercial interests, the laboring interests and the toilets of every we will answer the demand for a gold standard by saying to them, we shall not press upon, down upon you the brow of the labor, this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon this cross of gold. Yeah. <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, let's thank, thank you very much, like Jim, man. Let's thank you very much. All right, um, I'll be uh, quick and eclectic as usual here. Um, regarding, uh, I heard a lot of here about money having intrinsic value. And there basically was only one form of money ever produced. I have actually seen one of these. They're very, very rare. But they did produce at one time a coin. It was about this big. It was made out of coal. And that was the one coin that truly had an intrinsic value because if it didn't have any value or anything, you could always put it in your stove and keep warm. Um, but by the way, the uh, uh, this week at the convention center in Rosemont is the uh, New Numismatic Society convention. I was hoping to get up there. Uh, the coin collectors um, they look upon coins, however, as not this thing with the value and tradable value, but uh, as more or less today works of art. That's all they, they have high regard for them for. There's, there's, there's no monetary value uh, assessed. I mean, there are some gold coins floating around, but those are of significant origin date. Um, regarding the economy, um, you know, the, we need an economy operated by the government. And in that sense, it's got to be regulated. Uh, we've got to be cautious, as I heard from Ted and others, that certainly you've got to take under control the 1% because they, they will be subject to the worst impulses and not operate ethically. Uh, this thing about the gold standard is, is not worth discussing. Society uh, has advanced, and wealth is now transferred electronically uh, on a multinational, international basis. Uh, to talk about some hard currency thing is anachronisms. Uh, the, the, that's what I mean. It, it's not reflective. Of, of contemporary economics. Anybody knows that stocks and so forth, financial activities are all transferred electronically this today. And to say that often some distant remote location is some hidden transference of wealth doesn't really make any sense. The, the thing is, if you're serious about economics, um, 
I think you ought to look at the talking about the government and the economy are one and of inseparable. And we have to look at what we're going to do with that. Now, Elizabeth Warren seems to have made this a keystone of her campaign for president. And Bernie Sanders is someone along with her, shares equal concern. Uh, he's also done some things like the Sunrise Act, which uh, Ron Paul didn't like, didn't think went far enough, but both of these have made the reform of the economic system uh, part of their campaigns for president. Now, I was looking at the libertarian view, since we have a number of libertarians here tonight, and I was going to say that uh, um, just looking at their platform here at 2.7, I, I just one thing, I, you don't have to add to this, but it says they're against student loans. Yeah. Student loans guaranteed why? Are you against people? No, no. I became a librarian because uh, of student loans. Read what it actually says, Charlie. No. It <laughs> says we support ending student loans guaranteed. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, why? Why don't you want to have young people educated? I'm not going downtown to a bank and getting a loan. And I became a librarian and served no. the, the regulated loans <laughs> for years because yeah, they, of that. They, they can't default. Me to go to Ivy League school and you say you're not going to guarantee it. I don't understand this. And then this thing that we're going to, we're, we're not going to, we're not going to, we can use, be free to use as money any, any mutually agreeable items. I mean, are you talking about something like barter? We're not going to have money. This is a party of platforms. We're going to eliminate money. We're not going to vote for these guys. Thank you very much. Get rid of money. There's a platform. All right, oh train ship. All right, like cavemen. That's that's their platform. Okay. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna rebut now. I like yeah. This will be the last rebut. The economy's going to the economy. Okay. Uh, we're talking about uh, you know money and monetary systems as it relates to politics. Well, there's a few major <laughs> rock hard solid facts uh, that have been proven over time. Uh, they're spelled out in easy to read books if you like to read books or you can log on to the internet. Smedley Butler, General Butler in 1935 wrote a book called War is a Racket. It's been reprinted numerous times uh, up until now, and uh, the current edition uh, is uh, veterans groups are trying to get that into all high schools before uh, any better, any uh, young person is ever reproached by a recruiter. He said, war is a racket. He spelled out the huge profits corporations make by selling stuff to armies in wartime rather than peacetime. In 1959, 1960, I think it was, when he left office, Dwight Eisenhower. Eisenhower warned us about the military-industrial complex. Today, our military-industrial complex that's paid for with our tax dollars is the biggest, most profitable, the best financed killing machine on the planet. It's destroying environments all over the world in the name of, quote, hunting for terrorists, but the only place they're hunting for terrorists are where they want to drill for oil or lay new oil pipelines across Afghanistan. The only place they were hunting for Osama bin Laden was on both sides of the new pipeline route, 514 miles across Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. That's why we invaded those countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, many uh, talking heads now are saying that 9-11 um, was used in a, as an excuse to invade countries that had nothing to do with 9-11. Mm -hmm. They're all nibbling at the bullet. They don't want to come out and say 9-11 was created 
to be our new Pearl Harbor, but they'll get there. Uh, mm -hmm. Sir Thomas More, way back, and it was an award-winning movie, Sir Thomas More pointed out in his trial to the young Richard, he said uh, Richard was one that was made, uh, given a, an office uh, with a title and everything for lying under oath. It's like uh, the forerunner of the intellectual prostitutes we have today in Congress. We give them a whole bunch of money and they'll produce reports that just put out bald faced lies. Today we're seeing well paid prostitutes telling us there's no problem with global warming. No problem with climate change while mm -hmm. they got pictures of the ice melting at the North, South Pole and Greenland. Greenland alone, that ice is going to be enough to raise the sea level 23 feet later in this century if we don't do something to stop the melting. That's a fact. That's not an opinion, incidentally. Uh, it's forensic evidence. Uh, a young person that's uh, started an army of young people that's getting bigger they're, it's called Fridays for the Future, School Strike for Friday. Uh, she's coming over here. Who knows the name of the sailboat that's coming across the Atlantic? Does anybody know the name of, of a solar-powered boat that's coming across the Atlantic Greta Thunberg's. right now with Greta Thunberg? It takes two weeks. It's called Malizia 2. That kid outside the United States, she's the most famous teenager on the planet. She's going to be giving high-level speeches <coughs> to world leaders starting here at the UN and all the way to South America about, the, as Greta said simply, playing by the rules has failed us. Playing by the rules has totally failed humanity. Something has to change or we're looking at, not us, the kids. The kids now are looking at catastrophic conditions in 40 years. September 20th, mark it on your calendar. September 20th kicks off a week of Friday for the Future protests. Kicks off Friday, but they're calling on all adults. The unions now are joining, they're calling on adults to take a day off from work and join the student protesters. Nobody, uh, there's several million students in 150 countries already signed up for that global strike. But it'll be Friday to Friday with we, uh, a week, there'll be a week of high-level climate meetings all over the world starting in September 20th this year. Because they're working with the scientists that said, the last thing I'll tell you, we have till 2030, maybe sooner. It's not a debatable issue. The forensic evidence is solid. They know how fast the ice is melting. We have to have a World War II mobilization like uh, many of our fathers did. Uh, they took a time out from college, took a time out from life, women went back to work. We had a four-year mobilization to solve the problem. Well, this year the kids are saying, we don't have to have a World War mobilization to kill a bunch of people. We have to build a bunch of solar panels, wind machines, electric cars. We have to electrify this nation. And it can be done economically because all the solutions are here. Greta, they tell Greta, stay in school and you can study and solve, solve the crisis. She said, everything's been solved. We don't need to study anymore. We need action among yeah, people at all levels to go in the right direction. And so that, that's where we are. Thank you much. Oh, we are. Oh, we are. Oh, we are. Okay, you get the last word, my friend. You're up. You get the last word. You get the last word okay. to summarize and uh, tell us why we need to get off the gold. We need to get back on the gold standard. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you guys for having me tonight because it yeah. is a, a very difficult exercise. You guys ask a lot of questions and you know I have to think on my feet and try to give the best answer I can. I can and of course, there are some that will not be satisfied with the answer that I gave, right. so that's okay. That's why we're here to disagree. But um, I personally believe that, yeah, we even if we cannot get back on the gold standard for whatever reason, because we have evolved as a nation, things have changed with innovation, everything is digital now, so it would be very hard to go back on the gold standard as if we were in the 1920s. But uh, I personally prefer that we, we go on a form of decentralized uh, monetary system such as Bitcoin. So if, for instance, Bitcoin can become a, uh, a system that actually expands throughout the country, 
I think it would be better than having fiat money. But that's, of course, my personal uh, opinion. We're here to disagree, and we can always have a debate. But um, yeah, that's what I believe. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm really grateful to be here. And thank you, Tim. Thank you, Chuck, for allowing me to speak. And I'll be here on November 23rd, 2019, to speak on the problem of egalitarianism. So this time it will be a subject of political philosophy, so all the socialists down there, let's talk. <laughs> all right, go ahead and gavel us out, Andy. Go ahead and yeah, gavel us out. Germinal. <laughs> Thanks, Germinal. Thank you. That's it for tonight. Uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, safe drive, safe. We can walk home, everyone. Ooh, we got a problem. Attaboy. Oh.